good at teaching. We're good at telling other people what it is that we think they should do. But sometimes we have areas in our lives that really we just need God to deal with in our own hearts. And when you're at a conference, it's easy to come and take information away for the next project you have in mind or the situation in someone's life that you're dealing with. You know, oftentimes as leaders, we don't learn to lean back in for us. And I know over these last few years, a few days, you've had many impartation that has helped you, strengthened you, and we're going to open the Word of God again. And sometimes I think in our church services, we need to stop more often before we do this and mark the moment. You know, this book is life-changing. This book is holy. The words inside these pages did not come cheap. It's your ancestry. It's your family, bloodline in the faith. Stories in here that have cost dearly. And we, the leaders, get to open this book and teach from it regularly. But sometimes I think we forget to honor the word. So before I open the word, I'm asking you to open your heart. You might say, well, God, you know, I've taken a lot of information in and we're kind of winding down now. I kind of, I'm asking you to say, God, speak to me. I'm not full yet. I don't know all that I need to know. I have areas in my life that I've not actually talked to anyone about over this conference. Is that situation back home that I have to go back to? God, I know you have a word I know that you're speaking, but God, I'm just deciding again to listen. So Father, we lean in. We lean into your presence. We honor this book, the Word. It has words of life in it. it. has words that challenge us, prune us, call us to go deeper and call us to reach higher. Lord, I pray in this next few moments that there will be an openness, a receptivity. That where barriers are up, they would come down. Where judgment is present, we'd set it to one side. But I pray that we would not become comfortable with where we're at. But we would have a hunger to go where you need us to go. Thank you for this movement, New Wine. I thank you for its name and I thank you for what it represents in our nation. I thank you for its history. But God, I'm excited for its future. And so I pray today that we will grab your word with great faith, knowing that our best days are ahead. They are not behind us, they have not been, but they are yet to come. And I pray for every single person in this room, they would wake up to the part that they must play, the job that you have given them to do. There is no spare person in this room. There is no one that is ready to give up and quit. There is no one that is done yet. Because when we have breath in our lungs, there is still something you wanna use our hands to do. So God, quicken purpose, awaken our hearts, we say, speak, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take your seats. Some of you will be familiar with me. I'm Charlotte, as I was just introduced as. Others of you, I will be new to your world and you will be new to mine. But I hope we can put that to one side and just decide that we're already family and we're already friends. We're building the church together in this kingdom, in this nation. We're building the church together because we want more people to come home. And that's the bond that we have as we open the word together in this segment. And, you know, I want to start before I go any further by reading a scripture that is very familiar to you. A scripture that you should all know back to front, inside out. I'm going to read it from Luke 5, verse 37 in the Amplified, where it says, No one pause." new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the fresh wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be ruined and destroyed. 
but new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, immediately desires new wine. For he says, the old is good, even better. Here's an amazing scripture. A scripture that as new wine you are familiar with. But a scripture that explains a tension that I believe is in all of our churches and is in the church globally that we must talk about and manage. The tension between those that want new wine, but those that still like the vintage. Those that are desperate for a new move, but those that actually are quite comfortable in their old ways. Those that say, yes, Lord, do it, bring it. And then in the next way say, but do it this way and through these people. Those that say, hey, God, we want to see the youth empowered. And then they say, but we want them to have the sense of us, their leaders. We want the new. And yet sometimes we're like, but we prefer the old. You know, the tension generationally, the tension in our churches between the things that we want for our future and yet our reluctance to let go of our past is something that we all have to walk And it's something we all have to find language for. It's something that we all have to navigate. And I have to say, I don't think that any one of us has yet learned how to do this really well. I get the privilege of being in a lot of churches. I get the privilege of seeing behind the scenes of a lot of great, amazing organizations. And sometimes I'm shocked what I see behind the scenes because up front, I thought they were actually doing what I just read. Up front, I thought transition was happening. Up front, I thought, yes, we're empowering the next generation. Up front, I thought that the older generation were, yes, we're cheering them on, only to go behind the curtain of church, because you do know that this is like Disney World, (laughs) but we all actually go behind that curtain and take our heads off. So I'm talking about real church. I've been in the same church, by the way. If you think I'm an itinerant speaker, think again. I've been in the same church all my life. I'm 42. I've actually been saved since I was 13. I've actually been pastoring and leading in the church since I was 20. And so I've been in the same church all my life. I've tried to escape several times without success. But I have been planted in the house. So when I say I know what it is to be a local church pastor, be in the church, I've done everything from kids' church to toilet cleaning duties to ending up preaching, which was not my idea that I would end up doing this. I'm as shocked as you are that I am up here this morning. But when you get behind the scenes from Disney World, you realize, wow, there's a lot of dysfunction. Can we just be honest? There's a lot of dysfunction in the church. And so I am going to, in these next few moments, talk to you about the awkwardness of ministry. Everybody said? No, you should really be saying amen right about now. (laughs) This may not give you goosebumps. It may not have you jumping on your chair and shouting, woohoo, that's awesome. It will probably make you go, wow, ooh, ow. But honestly, we have to begin to talk more from the pulpit about the things in our ministries that are awkward. Because the more we talk about the awkwardness, the more the awkwardness will begin to dissipate and the more we'll be able to deal with things that when we don't talk about the awkwardness, build up to become mountains when actually we could have beat them before they ever got to become a mountain. The more things we brush under the carpet and shove behind the curtain and say, let's not tell the church. Let's just pretend some of you right now at this conference are here with your team pretending that you all love each other. (laughs) And your team are like, how much longer do we have to put up with this show? (laughs) Like when you take your kids somewhere and you're like, you will behave. You will not fight. You will not call your brother that name. You only have to hold it together for an hour and 30 minutes while we visit this relative. After that, we can all go back to being the gambles. But in the next hour and 30 minutes, they will think that you love your sister and you love your brother and we are good people. Is everybody in agreement? Yes. And you walk out the car and you become this other family. And then you go in the car and World War III breaks out again seconds later. And so awkwardness is in all of our ministries. The people that live one corridor apart in your office block but cannot stand each other because they don't see eye to eye. 
The accounting department that cannot make sense why you employed the youth department. The people in your organization that are like, well, if we just did it my way, we'd all be good. The ones that say, you know what? Well, I've always liked it this way. It's always worked this way. So why are you messing with it? Those conversations, the awkwardness of ministry. You know, we need an anointing for the awkward. We do. If we would all ask God more to help us with an anointing that would help us put our hands on the awkward areas of ministry, I honestly think the church would be way further on than she is right now. Because the truth is, when we hit those awkward conversations, usually we don't want to have them. We handle them badly. And in handling them badly, we usually split the church. And that's why often you'll find churches that are full of reactionary young people that said, well, nobody's empowered me and no one's believed in me, so I'm going to start my own church. And then you find resentful people that have been in ministry a long time. And they're like, you know what? You don't respect us. You don't, you don't see what we're coming from. You're not listening to us. And we end up and we call it, well, we're having a split. We're having, we say we're planting out. Hello. We're going to plant this people out. No, you're going to shove them out because you don't want to deal with it anymore. I think we just need to get more honest. I'm all for honesty in the church because I wish we could save more people. I wish we could help more people. There's no one in this room that's perfect. There's not one of us in here that's got it all down when it comes to leadership. And the more we're willing to have the awkward conversations, the more people are going to stay in leadership for the long haul. The Bible's full of awkward encounters. It's full of awkward conversations that Jesus had with his team. Awkward interactions from one disciple to another. Awkward moments when they should have known the answer, but they didn't. Awkward fallings out and disagreements. I mean, how awkward is it when Jesus tells you that you are like Satan himself? Hello. That's an awkward moment to be around. And Jesus didn't do it secretly. Others heard it. I want to take you to a story in the Bible. It's found in 1 Kings 19. And from this story, we see the awkwardness that was involved in actually a season that was about a transition. A season that could have gone a very different direction than we're about to read it went. A season when actually it could have been the closing of the chapter of one man's legacy. And it could have been a void of nothing in between. But God stepped in. And God began to instruct and began to maneuver these two men that were involved in this story. It's the story of Elijah and Elisha. Many messages have been preached from this scripture. Many great sermons that have come out of what happened in this one chapter because a lot goes down in this one chapter. But I want to, for the sake of time, concentrate in the time I have on the awkwardness, actually, that had to be overcome in this piece of scripture. And I am praying that if you identify yourself at all in any of these moments that I'm going to refer to, You would ask God today when I finish this segment to give you the grace in your awkward moment, to give you wisdom in your awkward moment so that you end up just like this story ends up. See, this story was going to be an ending that was premature with a man of God that said, I am done and it is over. But because he went with God's suggestion and because he was willing to embrace the awkward, it actually ends up with him in a chariot and a double legacy for the future. My question is, would you like to lie down under a tree or would you like to go home in a chariot? You choose. The context of this story is that Elijah is tired. Anybody else in here tired? The rest of you are lying. I mean, come on, ministry is tiring. Is anybody in here tired? A little weary. It's tiring. It's tiring to be in ministry. Elijah knew that. He was tired. He was weary. And there is nothing wrong with being tired and weary. I think Jesus was tired. I would be tired. Nowhere in my Bible does it say you shouldn't be tired. In fact, it actually says, if you're tired and if you're weary, Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me and I'll show you how to rest. And then the next line is, and I'm going to show you how to work. It doesn't say I'm going to show you how to take a sabbatical in Hawaii for six months. 
I looked, not even the Amplified says that. So there is an expectation that we will be tired, that we will be weary. And you need to know that about yourself because weariness and tiredness often leads to grumpiness. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands right now, (laughs) but you know who you are in the room. And we might blame everybody else, but the simple truth is we become tired. And in our tiredness, we become weary of people. And in our weariness of people, we become more edgy, we become more grumpy, we become more short, and the people around you, the immediate people around you, begin to suffer those consequences. Elijah was tired, and the context is he's worn out, and now he's like, you know what, I'm done. I've done miracles, I've seen good times in the church, I've seen God do incredible things through my life. You know what, I am satisfied that I have done. And you know what? I'm really not up for another run. I'm really not up for, you know, getting up and doing this again. I'm really not up for going out and, you know, finding another way forward. I I actually, God, you know, I would just like you to know that I'm going to lay down under this tree and you can take me home. I'd like to be out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. Be careful in your weariness, the praise you prayer. Be careful in your weariness, the confession in your mouth. See, when you're tired, your eyes begin to close. And when your eyes begin to close, your perspective begins to shrink. And with droopy eyes, all you can see is your disappointment. All you can see is the fact, well, things don't look like I thought they should look. Maybe you came here and you're like, I'm tired. This is not where I thought I would be at this time in my life. This is not how I thought the church would look. This is not what I thought would be happening in New Wine. I'm weary. I'm tired. I've come to conference to find myself a tree. I'm going to lie under it. I'm going to let God know I resign. I quit. I'm done. Well, Elijah tried just that. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life and lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. But all at once an angel came and said, get up and eat. I love that little line because here's what the angel didn't say. Oh, rise, I prophesy over you, your future. I will speak a word over you that will give you direction with five points of what this next season of your ministry is going to look like. I am going to perform a miracle in front of you to remind you of the greatness of who God is. No, this was very practical. You see, in some of you, you don't listen to this God. He's not exciting enough for you. But honestly, God's saying to some of you, get up and have something to eat. You're tired. You're grumpy. And you need to eat. He needs some food. He needs some energy. And he eats and he falls back asleep and then the angel comes back and says, you need a little bit more food. I don't know who feeds you, but someone should be. I know you might be feeding everyone else, but I tell you, if you're not feeding yourself, if you're not making sure that you're having food for your spirit and your soul and things that energize you and restore your soul, then you'll end up in this place too. And the answer is often not super spiritual. The answer is actually natural. Get up and eat. Do something that re-energizes you. And so he eats and he drinks and he says, now you need to do this because there is a journey you're about to go on. You're not going to make it unless you eat. We know the next part of scripture is that God comes to speak to him. But not in the way that he is familiar with. Not in the spectacular, not in the wind, but in the whisper. And you know, in your weariness, God will begin to whisper. Now, I have to tell you, you might not like what he's about to say, but he will say it. Because Elijah, in his weariness, received a whisper, and the whisper said this, go back the way you came. You're about to leave here about to go out of these doors this afternoon and you're gonna chances are go back the way you came 
You're going to go back to that place where you're building church. You're going to go back to that team that do not see eye to eye. You're going to go back to the financial pressure. You're going to go back to the question that you have. You're going to go back to the uncertainty about the future of your movement. You're going to go back to the table to discuss what do we do next. But God was sending him back, but he said, you're going to go back, but you're not going to go back to do what you think. You're going to go back because you're going to start to share the load. You're going to go back and I have something for you to do that was not on your plan, but it's on my plan and it's to do with the next generation. You're going to go back and I'm actually going to put a name in your heart and I'm going to give you a direction to go in and you're going to have a lot of questions about where I'm sending you, but you're going to have to trust me and go with it because your weariness will not be solved by you being this man of God all by yourself. Your weariness is because of the weight you're carrying and the weight is too much for you to bear on your own. So I'm going to send you back and you're going to go find a guy in his name is Elisha. God's going to send some of you home with the whisper of a name. He's going to send some of you home with the idea of something that will begin to help you share the weight that is on your shoulders. It'll begin to help you see a way forward for the future of your church. See, many of us are so concentrated on our success, but God is always focused on succession. God is not going to feed your personal success, but he will feed the succession of his call and his church and his ministry. When we begin to build our own empire, we're all on our own. But when we begin to build a legacy, when we begin to build something that will outlast you, and we're not going to wring the towel out and lie under a tree and say, well, I've had my fun, I'm out. But instead, we're going to say, okay, God, I get back up. Because I understand you're not finished with me yet because there's something I have to pass on. Every single one of you in this room, there is something you're supposed to pass on. I don't care how old you are, there is something you're supposed to pass on. The youngest person in this room, there is something you're supposed to right now be passing on. Why do we wait till we're passed out? Don't wait till you're passed out with your dying breath to say, <gasps> about the church, <gasps> let me tell you, <gasps> these are the things I learned. It's too late. <laughs> tell me now. Help me now. Show me now. But oftentimes we don't because we don't want them to look as good as us. Well, I had to learn mine the hard way, so so should you. No, last time I checked, we're supposed to be family. We'll sort of help each other out. Now, what we're about to read is the encounter between Elijah and Elisha. This is the most awkward encounter. It's awkward in every sense of the way. And I think somehow we've glamorized this moment. But when I read my Bible, I don't see this as glamorous. I see this as just awkward. And I have to say to some of you, when you go home and you begin to think about the future and you begin to make some different decisions and you begin to do what Elijah is about to do, it will be awkward before it gets easy. It will be awkward before it gets easy to navigate new wine to old. It will be awkward before it gets easy to put some things in place that you know are not about you, but they're about the future. It will be awkward but we have to embrace the awkward. He says, Elijah went from there after God had told him, get up and go home. He went from there and he found Elisha, son of Saphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And Elisha went up to him and he threw a cloak around him. And Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. And he said, and then I'll come with you. And Elisha replied, oh, oh, go back. What have I done to you? Imagine the scene. Here comes Elijah. He's fresh out of under his tree moment. He really doesn't want to be going the direction that he's going, but God told him, go back the way you came. He has no idea who this guy is. He has no idea what God's plan for this guy is. And so he gets up and he begins to walk to the place where this young man is. 
When he gets there, this guy is busy with his own life. He's busy with his own plow. He's busy taking care of his own business. He's not looking on the lookout for this man of God. He's not there saying, oh, I've been praying days for someone like you to arrive. And so he walks into his world knowing God needs me to help you take the future forward. But I have no language for it. I have no relationship right now to explain it. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do in this moment. Everything about it must have been awkward. Have you ever been in those moments where you see great potential and you have no relationship and you're not sure how to get the potential to help build the future and it looks like the gifted potential person is not even interested in your approach? And there's this awkward gap and often generations don't even speak to each other. We don't close the gap. We don't have the conversations. We just keep walking by. But I want you to see what he did next is where I believe we can begin to close the gap of the awkward. It says Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. You know, his cloak it wasn't just a garment. His cloak represented so much of the weight of his ministry. His cloak was precious to him. His cloak had been there in the moments when God had done the most magnificent things in and through him. His cloak was what he'd put on as protection. His cloak was what he had hid his face in on the side of the mountain. His cloak was what he had tucked up as he had outrun a chariot. His cloak had been there in those moments with him. His cloak was what he laid his head on as he said, I want to quit and I want to die. And in that awkward moment of not having the language to say to the next generation what he needed to say, in that awkward moment of not having a plan and not being very clear about what comes next, it's like the Spirit of God. It's like this, this instinct in him began to take off the very thing that meant the most to him. Began to take off the garment that represented what his ministry had been through. And he took the cloak and he threw it over the shoulders of this young, unsuspecting man. And you know, I've been in ministry a long time. And I've been around a lot of people that throw titles. I've been a lot of people that throw and delegate jobs. I've been around a lot of situations where I have been thrown a curveball. I've been around a lot of places where people have thrown their opinion. But I haven't found many places where people throw their cloak. See, when you throw your cloak, you say, hey, I am not asking anything of you in this moment. But I'm putting something over you. I'm putting a cover on you. I'm sharing with you in this moment something that has cost me everything, but I don't want to hold it just for me anymore. It's like he had this picture in his mind. I don't know what to do, but I think I'm supposed to. I think I'm supposed to throw my cloak. See, the minute he took his cloak off, he was exposed. And the reason why we don't like to throw cloaks to one another in ministry is because you're going to see who I really am. I'm going to have to get a little bit more vulnerable. I'm going to have to be a little bit more honest. I'm not going to look as put together as you might want me to be. But I have learned more from one moment of someone's cloak than I have of hours of teaching about being a great communicator. I've learned more in one moment of someone pulling me to one side and sharing with me something that I know has cost them that I know they have journeyed, that I know was expensive and they're giving it to me for free. It's those moments that in the awkward silence, something happens spirit to spirit that we have got to get back in our churches because we have a lot of people in ministry that are putting their hand up for a title. But actually what they really need to feel first is the weight of the mantle. 
Because when you've felt the weight of the mantle, you're less keen for a title. <laughs> when you've worn the cloak for a few moments, you're like, let me think about this for a little while. But we're so keen to look like we're empowering. Or we're so keen to look like we're, you know, generationally we're good. That we begin to throw out titles and delegate tasks. But all the while, we're keeping our cloak in the leadership cloakroom. We hang our cloak up, we protect our cloak, we keep our connections, we keep our contacts, we keep our journey. But if we really want to build the church so that it has a double anointing, a double legacy, a double advancement, then we've got to start dropping our cloaks. And every single one of you has a cloak. You have history, you have experience, you have mistakes. You have moments where you're like, if someone had told me, if only someone had shown me, instead of watching me fail where they failed, instead of holding their cloak because, you know what, this is my cloak and I deserve it and I worked 25 years in ministry to earn it, get your own. We laugh, but sometimes, sadly, that's the truth. When you meet someone that is willing to share their cloak. They don't give you tips for ministry. They give you time. They don't give you, this is what you should do in five easy steps. They take your hand and they walk the steps. They don't say, well, you know what? You should listen to this and you should get this podcast and you should go to that seminar. They say, you should come over and we should have dinner. And we should talk. And we should share heart. And I know some of you say, well, I once threw my cloak. But they threw it right back at me. Welcome to the ministry. But he didn't stop Jesus. That's what Judas did, but he still loved others. He still kept giving himself. He still kept sharing his journey. He still kept giving his experience. Don't put your cloak away because of your heartbreak. Understand, maybe it didn't fit that person. But there will be one that when the cloak touches them, something will happen on the inside of them, like it did for Elisha. What happens when the cloak touches Elisha is the awkward thing. It's the awkward moment. I don't know whether Elijah thought when I throw my cloak on him, he's going to go, he's going to go, this is all I have lived for. I feel it. The anointing is on me. I don't know what he expected. And this is the thing you have to understand when you're the Elijah in this picture. The response you can't control. You can't control the response of the person. When you've sat there and given them the wealth of your wisdom and they go, Cool. <laughs> and you want to kill him. You're like, cool. Do you know how many years of pain that just took me? You, you can't control their response. But that doesn't mean you should hold off your cloak. So now the awkward kicks in because now I've just exposed myself. Now I've thrown this cloak on you that represents so much journey, so much history. So many vulnerable moments for me. I've thrown this cloak on you and this is his response. His response is, uh, I have to go see my mom and dad. I actually have to go kiss them goodbye. And Elijah is clearly so shaken by the response. His response tells you everything. Elijah goes, what have I done to you? Just go, go, go back. This was a terrible mistake. I, I, I didn't know that this would happen. It's like he can't understand what's going on. And so he's like, yeah, just go home. Forget it. Forget I ever came. Forget I ever suggested it. Forget I ever opened my heart. You know what? It's not going to work. But what was going on in that young man is what I'm appealing for to go on in every young person in this room. See, Elisha did feel it. Elisha understood the weight that he was being pulled under. He understood the legacy that was in the garment. He understood what the throwing of the cloak meant. Elisha got it. He didn't have words to articulate yet his response, but his heart knew 
where he goes, I need to go. But here's what Elisha did that many of us that are younger in this room have not done. Some of you are in this room and you're below the age of 30, below the age of 20, and people are graciously giving you a cloak right now. Well, this is what Elisha's response was. He said, I'm going to go home because what I need to do in response to this entrustment is I need to go burn some plows. I need to go and deal with some things that represent my independent spirit. I need to go and burn some things that actually will keep me coming back to the place that I need to move on from. I actually need to go and kiss some people goodbye that actually are not part now of my future and it would be wrong for me to make that emotional drag with you, Elijah, and your ministry. It's not your job to go close this door, Elijah. I'm going to go close some doors. Elisha, in that moment, he went back to uncouple himself from the things that would keep him from being able to serve the man of God in the way he knew God needed him to. And if you're a younger person in this movement and you're being entrusted with room and a cloak is being extended, can I ask you and appeal to you to stop leaving your options open, to stop playing with the ministry. And if you're going to commit, then commit in a way that shuts the door. You see, he said, I'm going to go home and kiss goodbye my family. Oh, for the day when that would be the story of how we leave churches, how we move on and transition. You know what this season's done for me? But I'm not slamming the door in resentment or anger or saying, see, I've found something better. But I'm going to go kiss goodbye that which was good for me up until now. I'm going to kiss goodbye that season of my life that served a purpose that has brought me thus far. I'm going to kiss it goodbye. See, what you kiss goodbye can bless your future. But what you slam the door in the face of will revisit you because what you sow, you reap. Reactionary leaving does not help for building great in your future. And I love that this young man was saying, no, I get it. I feel it. I sense it. But I also owe it to you, Elijah to go deal with some things that only I can deal with. He says he went home and he went back and he took the yoke of the oxen and he slaughtered them and he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and he gave it to the people and they ate. And then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. He chose. I'm as much in this moment as you are. I don't know what stage you're at in your ministry. I don't know where this lands for you. But we have to understand, if we're going to move past these points, where the new wine can't quite figure out where it fits yet, and the old wine still tastes great and people love it, but we're not really sure how to put these two things together, If we're going to transition our churches, not so that you run your race until you're under a tree dying and I'm done, so find a replacement. That's not the way to go out. That's not the way to end your call. That's not the way to hand off to another generation. You're not supposed to wring out the towel until you feel you've done everything you want to do and then say over to the next person. But God instead doesn't want us to lose the ground that we've been fighting for all these years. But instead, he wants us to add to the ground. So when Elijah said, I'm done, God's like, no, you're not done. Because actually, for you to be done now would mean that everything that we've done to this point will be lost. And actually, the anointing on you was not supposed to just be for you, but there's a double load of it for the next person. But unless you're willing to go meet the next person, unless you're willing to embrace the awkward, we will never get the handover that I have planned for the future. And if we in the church are not willing to embrace the awkward, we won't see either. I'm sure in the hearts of all of you, new wine is not that new wine would have a good run and then settle. And then we start all over again and have another little good run and then we settle. I'm sure in your hearts is that what has been built year after year 
would then strengthen the next year after year. And then would next strengthen the year after year. And the only way that happens is that every single one of you in this room, everyone has to get good at throwing your cloak. See, when you throw your cloak, and if you're throwing your cloak, you have people sat next to you today in conference that are your Elisha. They've come with you because why wouldn't they follow you? Because they decided the moment you invested that cloak to them that, hey, I'm coming. Hey, there's a part of this I want to serve. I know you didn't ask me to, but I want to see. Elijah never said the words, I am asking you to give up your business, leave your family, and come serve me. He never said it. He didn't have to say it. Some of us are making demands, and then we're getting mad when the demands are not fulfilled. But when you throw cloaks, you don't have to make demands. The weight of what was on you begins to rest on them. Some of you are keeping things like this tight. Well, we won't tell them. But actually, if you told them, they would carry things differently. They would lean in more. They would help take the weight more. They would understand more. And we have to open conversations up in our generations where we say, hey, I have a cloak. It's been on a long journey. I want to wrap it around your shoulders. We have to have a younger generation that when they feel the cloak, say, hey, I have a plow. I have a ministry I've spent all this time working on for myself. And you know what? In this moment, that independent thing that I've got going on, I think it needs to die for the bigger gain. I'm not going to keep my lifeboat, as it were. I'm not going to keep my options open. If you've ever taken anyone on your team, and they're very gifted, and they're very talented, but they also have lots of options. <laughs> And you happen to be the favorite this month. You can't build with that. Sometimes you have to say to Elisha, I need you to burn your plow. If I'm about to pour out in the way I know I need to, I need to know, are you going back to your plow? Are you going to go back to that thing if this doesn't work out? Am I an optional extra for your life? I am believing God and I am praying across our nation We'd stop avoiding awkward. Right now in some of your departments, it's just awkward. You know it's awkward. They know it's awkward. And I'm encouraging you and I'm asking you, have the conversation. You say, well, how do I start it? With a cloak. Hey, let's have a coffee. Can I tell you about this time in ministry when I went through this season? I just need to be honest with you. I'm just really struggling right now to find the words to navigate. You know, we'll get more done when we begin to remove our cloaks instead of put on our boxing gloves. Some of you are weary because you're in the wrong fight. You're weary because you're in the ring with an issue that God has not anointed you to be in the ring with. And some of you are fighting foliage, but actually the real issue, it's still there. You know how I know? Because I do the job that you all do. I'm in a church that's had to handle transition time after time after time. And do I think we've done it perfect? Absolutely not. Do I think I've learned? Absolutely. Do I think I'm learning? Absolutely. But when you meet someone, thanks guys. I don't know, when you meet someone, I guarantee right now if I was to say, who is that someone that put a cloak over your shoulders? There'd be someone. And it's probably the reason why you're in ministry. Someone that just extended that moment to you. Someone that didn't just tell you what to do, but walked it with you. And as I bring my message to a close, I'm asking you, just like Elijah, he was about to go back home. He said, go back the way you came. When you go back, here's some names that I'm going to drop into your heart and mind. Here's some names of some people I need you to go and tend to. 
Here's some things that I need you to actually be willing to take off so that you can put them on. Here's some thinking that actually I need you to adjust because this is not about building a successful church. It's about building a legacy. It's not about getting the most numbers or getting the most achievement. It's about actually when I'm gone, this thing is so strong. It's carrying on to a whole nother level, way greater than I could have ever built. You know, I love that moment in David's life. Imagine all your life dreaming of building a temple for God. Imagine all of your energy, all of your time, all of the dream in your heart to do it. You have the plans in your bedroom of the building you're going to have and what you're going to make it look like and the ministry. I mean, you've got it. And then God turns to you and says, I'm sorry, but that thing, you're not going to get to do it. I don't know whether I would have responded like David. I think I would have been mad at God. I think I'd have said, well, then that's fine. I'll just rip these plans up. You know what? This has been a complete waste of my life. I fought all these battles and I don't even get to do the one thing I wanted to do. But I love what happened in David because here's what he said. He said, okay. And then he said this, my son who's coming through behind me he said, there's two things I know. He's young and he's inexperienced. Now that I know those two awkward factors, all this responsibility and yet hardly any experience, all this responsibility and yet very young. He's young and he's inexperienced. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take care of everything I can possibly take care of so that when he steps up, all the stuff that he would have to worry about, I have dealt with. All the things that I could help this get to the whole nother level with, I've taken care of. You know what? I'm going to ring my connections and say, hey, I'm going to need some help. You know what? I'm going to get that person to financially contribute and say, hey, I'm going to pay off this debt. And you know there's that moment when Solomon stands before God and God says, ask me for whatever you want. You know why that moment wasn't wasted? Do you know why in that moment something awesome happened for the kingdom? Because everything that could have been on his mind from a bad handover had been removed. So when he stood before God, he didn't need to say, I need money, because David had taken care of it. He didn't need to say, I need laborers, because dad had worked to get connections, so that was not a problem. He didn't need to say, I need plans, because they were already handed over. So all he was left to say was, give me wisdom. The one thing you need when you're young and inexperienced. It's our job to set each other up for a win. It's our job to throw our cloaks to cover where people are young and inexperienced. It's our job to get up from under our tree of weariness and say, this is not about me. It's about making sure there's a double anointing for the future. It's our job when we feel the cloak and the weight to say, I don't take this lightly. Let me go kiss some things goodbye so I can serve you well. You know what? I don't take this lightly. Let me go burn some plows. Though it's going to be hard for me to do, I'm going to burn them because I need you to know I'm in. And I'm all in. And Once you know that, once you get past the awkward, awesome becomes very possible. My prayer over you is that awesome would be in your future. I don't mean awesome in a success. I mean awesome in succession. Awesome in legacy. Awesome in cloak throwing and plow burning. Awesome that when you come to conference next year, next to you, of five or six people wearing your cloak. And they're there like, hey, I'm here because whew, I felt what was on him. I'm like, boy, you need me to come. I need to be in those sessions to take notes so when you forget them, I can remember them. You know what? You're not in this thing alone. I'm coming with you. And we're going to sit together. We're going to go out for dinner together. And we're going to process stuff together. That's what God designed the church to look like. But when we separate and make it awkward, it'll never look like that. 
So where is your Elisha? Who is your Elijah? All your Elishas in here, I know you think you're great, but you stand in the shadow of greatness. You should remember that when you pick up eventually the cloak. See, one day when it was time for him actually to go home, God sent a five-star limousine. He said, you can go home this time, but your bow out will not be under a tree from weariness. It will be in a cloud of glory. That's what you deserve, Elijah. Don't let the world tell you to lie under a tree and quit. Don't let intimidation say, you know what, what's the point? Give up. No, get up from under your tree and let's see this thing through. And that day came and when he saw it through, he kept saying, remember to Elisha, I have to go somewhere, stay behind. Elisha's like, "Uh uh-uh. No, 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 really, you need to stay behind. Uh Uh-uh. No, 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 honestly, five times he said, no, no, I'm going, you can't come with me. And he said, no, you don't understand. I settled this when I burned my plow. I settled this when I kissed goodbye. I will be with you until the end. And what dropped out of the chariot when he went to heaven? The cloak. The minute he saw it, he knew exactly what he had to do. All across the room, I want us to stand to our feet. Just close your eyes where you're at. Let's not rush out. Let's not go get our coffee. Your coffee will wait. Just close your eyes, just right where you're at. I'm asking you this question in this moment. What is the awkward? Where is the awkward? What is it? What situation is it? Where right now do you know you're actually detouring your ministry just to avoid it? Where is everything taking five times longer because no one wants to talk about that situation or address that person? It's the elephant in the room, but we're all going to pretend it's not there. Where is the awkward stopping you from moving forward? Where in this room is the one that's lying under the tree saying, I I just came here to really let God know this, I'm done. Where are you? What tree are you under? The tree of disappointment or rejection? The tree of failure? The tree of I didn't think it would look like this? God sees you in this moment under that tree. And he's going to say exactly the same to you. Get up, feed yourself. Get up and feed yourself. And then he's going to begin to whisper, not shout. He's going to begin to whisper about the future. He's going to say names and you're like, I don't even know who that is. I don't even get what you mean, God. And God's going to go, it's okay. Just get up. Trust me. He's going to say, go back the way you came. You mean go back to that same situation in the church? Go back? Go back. Make sure when you go back, you take your cloak. Because you're going to need it. And where is it that some of you are hesitant to throw your cloak? Because what if they react in a way I can't control? What What if it doesn't go in the way that I think it should? And God's saying to you, you have to be willing to throw your cloak again. I'm sorry it didn't work out the way you thought it should. But you're responsible for the cloak on your back. And where in the room is Elisha? Right on the edge of an opportunity. But in one hand is the oxen and the plow, and in the other is a relationship that you're resistant to let go of. God's asking you to kiss it goodbye. Let it go and embrace the call that you're fighting. So all across the room, whichever one applies to you, however you know, God, I need in this moment, I just, God, speak. Just begin to lift your hands all across the room. 
Just identifying with God your own journey, where you're at. You say, well, what will it mean by raising my hand? Nothing's going to happen. You know, sometimes we just have to send a signal to God. We just have to gesture to Him, God. I hear you right now in this moment. I know the situation, God, that you're referring to. I know it. Those that are under the tree, you're saying, God, I'm under the tree. Help me, feed me. This will not be where I end. Those of you that are saying, I I don't know whether I can throw this cloak. Those of you are avoiding awkward. Father, you see our hands raised in this moment. Spirit of God, now as we extend our hands to heaven, Lord, I pray there will be a sense of fresh energy and faith that would arise in our hearts. Lord, for those that have said, I don't know that I can do this anymore. God, I pray they will be quickened with purpose all over again. I pray that names would come to mind and possibilities would open. I pray that there'll be an opening and an awareness like never before, that you are not done, God. You are not done, but there is more to come. It's further down the road. It's further down the road. Lord, I pray for those that have a cloak on their shoulders, that God, they will begin to be willing to lift it off and expose who they are. Begin to say their story and tell their tale. Begin to share their journey, their brokenness and their wholeness. Lord, I pray for those that are receiving of cloaks, that God, they would be willing to take them with the humility that is right before you, to humble themselves and to accept the cloak with a sense of weightiness, to let go of the things that their independence wants to keep a hold of, to kiss goodbye the relationships that will compromise the future. Lord, I pray there will be an awkward anointing on our lives. We will be anointed for the awkward. He would not split our churches and divide our teams. He would not be divisive or have room to cause disunity. But God, we will be willing in the awkward to find a new anointing that will secure a double anointing for our futures. Lord, let us not build for success, but for succession. Thank you, God, that you have already gone before us. Thank you, God, you have chariot endings for every single one of us. Thank you, there is double anointing when we step from behind our plow. Pray over this movement, God. Pray over new wine. In this moment, Holy Spirit, I pray that cloak throwers would arise at a whole new level, that it wouldn't be left to just a few to extend their cloak. But I pray in every single church, leaders would begin to put their cloak onto the next generation. Lord, that legacy would be secured, not at the last dying breath, but now in these moments, it would be quickened by our actions. Lord, I truly pray that the new wine can find new wine skins and the vintage wine will be properly enjoyed and respected. Thank you, God, for what you're doing, but I thank you for what you are about to do. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you so much.